The Bible has much to say about the value of human life, especially preborn life. On today's edition of Truth for New Generation, we're going to talk about the nature of and value of human life from a biblical perspective, the value of life from the moment of conception onward. Welcome to Truth for a New Generation. The Bible has much to say about the value of human life, though pro-choice advocates would say otherwise. Let's talk about this. Hi, Alex McFarland here. So glad that you're with us. And you know, on the program, we talk about a lot of worldview issues, and certainly there's no more uh, important issue in worldview than the issue of human life. And much on the show throughout the last months, we've talked about natural law, how our Constitution and Declaration presuppose what is called objective truth, moral absolutes, natural law, that human beings matter. That's the most fundamental bedrock value of our Constitution, that all persons are endowed by their Creator, capital C, that's God, with certain inalienable rights. Among these, life, the most fundamental life. But I want to talk about the Word of God and the Bible and what the Bible clearly says about the sanctity of human life. Because there is a reason, and I'm not really going to give any names because I don't want to give any undue publicity to these groups. There are some that are saying that the Bible, the Scriptures really don't speak to the value of human life, and that's just ludicrous. And so I want to go over some verses, and we've got a very very special guest that you'll meet in a few moments. But let's talk about what the Bible has to say about human life. Let's look at this from a biblical perspective. The Bible says in Psalm 100, verse 3, what a beautiful scripture. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are the people and the sheep of his pasture. Psalm 100, verse 3. You know, the Old Testament prophet of Isaiah, oh my goodness, what a, uh, all the scriptures are important, but the book of Isaiah, 66 chapters written about 750 years before the birth of Christ. What an amazing prophet. Isaiah 44, 24, thus says the Lord, your redeemer and the one who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord. I'm the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone. God, the maker of the planets, our solar system, is your creator as well. Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, you're the potter, and all of us, all people, are the work of your hand. Now, let me, let me go about uh, another scripture or two about what God says about the nature of the preborn person. Uh, Psalm 139 is maybe the most famous scripture used in the abortion discussions, but it says this, so beautiful that the psalmist writes, for you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and my soul knows that right well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. By the way, a very philosophical term. Our substance, our essence, what we are, God saw it. As you for nine months were being carried in your mother's womb, God saw that. And what Psalm 139 says about preborn life is what the great philosophers and ethicists throughout history would say to concur. Being unformed, they were in your book. All my days were written. Even before I was fashioned, says Psalm 139. Jeremiah 1 verse 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, God says, Jeremiah, I set you apart to be a prophet to the nations. Even before you were born. See, God has a plan for every life. Luke 1, 41 and 44 speaks to the fact that preborns are human beings. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting... 
uh, Elizabeth was carrying John the Baptist, Mary was carrying Jesus, and the baby John the Baptist leapt in the womb. The one that would years later in John chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Luke 2 says this, that the Lord Jesus Christ, he was begun as an embryo growing into a fetus, an infant, a child. And it says that while they were there in Bethlehem, the time came for the baby to be born. And Mary gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and laid him in a manger. There was no room in the inn. Galatians 1.15 says, But when he who had set me apart before I was born called me, by his grace, that was the Apostle Paul, like the prophet Jeremiah, called, ordained before he was even born. So much more we could say, but God cares about all people. And yes, God cares about the preborn, and so should we. Stay tuned, we've got an incredible interview when we come back on Truth For A New Generation. My beliefs aren't exactly popular. You can tell me I'm on the wrong side of history all you want, but you won't change my mind. That's because I'm standing on something that doesn't change. Therefore, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. As Christians, it's important to remember that no matter how good or bad things may seem, nothing changes our King or our call. Welcome back to Truth For A New Generation. I'm so excited about the guests that you're about to meet because when we're talking about the subject of life, the sanctity of human life and the pro-life cause, honestly, there's no better voice in the nation, in my opinion, than Lisa Van Riper. And she's the president of South Carolina Citizens For Life. She's known nationally as an articulate voice. She's an educator. She's a magna cum laude graduate of Furman, Phi Beta Kappa. One of the interesting things about Lisa Van Riper, we worked together for eight years at North Greenville University, and she's one of the, the few people, uh, the only one that I know that has the Order of the Palmetto, which is the highest award a citizen of the state of South Carolina can uh, receive, and she's a friend and a colleague and just someone for whom I have a world of respect. But Lisa, thanks for being with us for a few moments on Truth For a New Generation. Alex, it's a delight to be with you and to see you again, even if it's just by TV and Zoom. Well, I think uh, 2020 has introduced lots of us to Zoom and TV. It's kind of a crazy world we're living in right now, isn't it? It certainly is in a lot of ways, at a lot of different levels. You know, Lisa, as you and I record this, even the moment we're recording this, uh, hearings are going on in Washington about the confirmation or attempted confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett. Let me ask you this, because right away, uh, there, from the moment her name was brought to the table as a replacement for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, there's just been a firestorm of discussion about what will her views be on life. She's a Catholic. She believes in natural law. What will she do in regards to Roe versus Wade? Uh, Lisa, why is this such a volatile issue right now? Well, Roe versus Wade was the was the Supreme Court decision, of course, in 1973, which really overturned every piece of protective legislation in the United States that had to do with the unborn child. Up until 1973, it was assumed that the um, states under its health and market moral clauses could regulate the procedure of abortion and it regulated to balance the rights of life of the mother and the child because the state viewed that this there were two lives involved and in one day the United States Supreme Court basically nationalized the abortion debate that means it brought it to the national level and made overturned every state law and then said that if the states were to make any new laws, it had to be within certain parameters. So in the first trimester, Roe versus Wade said that a woman had an absolute right to abortion, period, period. And that as long as a doctor performed the abortion and the woman gave her consent, the woman could 
demand an abortion for any reason, no reason, you do not have to give a reason. Now, what, what is more known today than was known then is that, a heart, that the child is genetically completed conception, fertilization, has a heartbeat at 17 days after fertilization, neural activity at 42 days, fingerprints at nine weeks, just fully formed can, so that a lot happens in that first trimester. You are who you are. In the second trimester, the US Supreme Court said, now that's from about 12 to 13 weeks up to about 24, 28 weeks that a state may say where a woman may have an abortion because it becomes more dangerous for the woman. But a woman still has a right to an abortion any reason, no reason, does not have to give a reason. Now, this is past the point of viability now, okay? Viability does not mean, by the way, that the child is not alive and of the human species. That just means that the child with aid of technology can live outside the womb of the mother, okay? So that has nothing to do with whether the child's alive. In the last trimester, the justices said that a because of the potential of human life now they never said alex that the child was a human life they said because of the potential of human life in the last trimester they didn't even mention potential life in the first two trimesters so here's a, a human a human being being of the human species state of active metabolism completely genetically complete heartbeat, brainwave, can feel pain, and, and yet the justices do not mention even potential life until you're in the last trimester, which is around, you know, 26, 28 weeks. They said because the potential for human life becomes greater, that a state may, it didn't say they had to, it said a state may prescribe or restrict abortion uh, at that point in pregnancy, except to preserve the life or health of the mother. Now, most people in 1973, this is before uh, ultrasound, before we know a lot about the unborn child, and they're thinking, you know, well, when you miscarry a child at about six months or so, you know, that's when you have a little funeral and stuff. They don't know. So, and they hear the word health and life and, and people are saying, well, that must mean the mother's health is so bad, her life would be threatened, right? Not right. what it meant at all. They come out with a second case that the media never talks about called Doe versus Bolton the very next day. And, and what, what year was that? Doe versus Bolton. It was out of the case of Georgia. And the, and, and what they said, they define, and they said these two cases need to be read together. They're called companion cases. And in it, they said, they define the word health. And they said, health is regarded as any factor relevant to a woman's well-being. And they included in those factors, social, economic, psychological, the care of other children in the home, even the stress of future child care. Now you tell me which one of those things you couldn't check. And so it is very accurate when we say abortion stops a beating heart. And it's very accurate when we say that we have abortion legally protected in this country. That means abortion means the intentional taking of an innocent human life in the womb. We have that legal for all nine months of pregnancy for virtually any reason, because some states do require you give a reason, but any reason will do. So you see this has happened in several states recently with Virginia and New York. They are codifying Roe v. Wade they're taking all restrictions away, and they are saying that 
there will be no protection, even after a child can feel pain. We're one of only seven countries in the world that allow abortion after 20 weeks when a child can feel pain. We're right up there with North Korea and China. So that's the state of the law. So why is this important? Yes. Alex, if the government, if the government does not, if when they separate the biological humanity from legal protection, which is what they've done, doesn't matter that you're genetically complete, doesn't matter you have a heartbeat or a brain wave or can feel pain or fingerprints, that will not get you protection because of Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade completely not the separated legal personhood from biological humanity. That, that means is so significant that every to point heartbeat, out. That means every heartbeat, should you become um, inconvenient even or too costly for our society, there is no guarantee your heartbeat will be be protected. Roe v. Wade goes to the essence of the Constitution. It goes to the essence of state rights. It goes to the essence of government's role, first and legitimate role, of protecting human life. That's why this is so important. It, it really is. What can people do to get involved for people, uh, whether or not they're religious, but they begin to say, okay, human life is worth protecting legally. Yeah. How can people get involved? Well, obviously, I mean, obviously you and I are religious people, and I hope that informs our views. But you can absolutely be an atheist without any regard to God, and you can be pro-life because Science leaves us no doubt, empirical observation leaves us no doubt that what we're dealing with in the womb is alive from the moment of fertilization, is in a state of active metabolism, and is a member of the human species. You know, goats don't beget people and people don't beget goats. We beget what's in the womb. We beget our kind. And so... I, I, you can absolutely, uh, you can, you, you don't have to be religious to understand that government's role, first and foremost, is to protect human life. Is this human life? And if it's human life, why does our law not protect this heartbeat? And finally, to understand that if they will not protect the heartbeat in the womb, it is only a matter of time before they do not protect the heartbeat of the person with dementia or disabilities, or any of those things. That's why the governor of Virginia could say, well, what if an abortion in the, the day before delivery, what if the abortion didn't produce a dead baby? Because believe it or not, a few babies survive these late-term abortions. And the doctor, I mean, the governor, who is a doctor, you might remember, said, well, we would keep the child warm and we would keep the child comfortable. And the mother would go off and consult and decide what to do with the child. Well, now, what he's saying there basically is we will decide whether we will go in and kill the child and not give the child care so the child Lisa, will die. There is no for, Hey, forgive me for breaking in here. We, we've yeah. got to pull away yeah. for a commercial. I want to have you back when we have more time, but we're, we're out of time in this segment. But you are president of South Carolina Citizens for Life. I want to thank you. This is rich information. And Lisa, thank you so much for being with and us. Folks, stay tuned. Alex, I know we've got to break, but it's terribly important. What can we do? We have to vote. This is a, this is a governmental issue. Amen. Amen. Vote and pray. Folks, stay tuned. Truth for a New Generation is back right after this. There is something welcoming about prepared places. At The Cove, we extend that welcome every single day. From the panoramic views, chef-crafted meals, and spacious meeting rooms, to our serene mountain lodging, stone fireplaces, and inviting rocking chairs. Our setting, carved into 1,200 wooded acres of the Blue Ridge Mountains, and our personalized service, will ensure that your group's visit is both memorable and renewing. No wonder we find such great comfort when Jesus says his Father's house has many rooms that he is preparing for us. So, 
The table is being set. Hearthside, the fires are ablaze. The stage is lit, the mic's checked. Come, experience this place prepared for you and your group at The Cove. Welcome back to Truth For New Generation. We're talking about a subject that's very, very uh, passionate on my heart, and that's the subject of life. But I want to change gears for just a second. I, I think clearly we can make the great argument that human life is sacred, significant, affirmed by the Word of God, by uh, the great thinkers throughout history, certainly by some of the great, most admirable leaders in history, from Mother Teresa to... Uh, just uh, great spiritual leaders, and obviously our founding documents affirm the value of human life. But I wanna, I wanna throw an idea into the conversation here, and that is to be pro-life doesn't simply mean that we defend the baby, but abandon the subject of life once the baby is born. Uh, and while it's clear, Exodus 21 through 17, the Ten Commandments on which our judiciary is based, includes the Sixth Commandment, Thou shalt not murder. And I believe abortion is the, the murder, the unjust taking of a human life. But let me just talk a little bit about being pro-life as it relates to caring for children and orphans. And, and the poor. I honestly think, and we say this on the show and in, in our books, that life is sacred in every context. We don't believe in euthanizing the elderly either. But, but right now, folks, uh, only a few miles from where I live is a great home, the North Carolina Baptist Children's Home. In Western North Carolina, there's the Cross North School, which is one of America's great orphanages. And, and I want to say this in terms of being pro-life, and I want to encourage you to pray about this. Do you know right now in orphanages around uh, the nation, there are, there are hundreds of thousands of children that don't have a family. There are 10 million children right now in foster care, and God bless the families that take children in to help raise them as foster parents. What a rewarding thing that you can do to show your pro-life position. But do you know, sadly, there are some, it's estimated, 60 million orphans that are homeless right now. That's a staggering number. And think about it, that when a child in a, a foster care situation or an orphanage is, uh, reaches, say, 17, 18, 19, if they've not yet been adopted, 18, 19, they're instantly homeless. I mean, really. Now, since 1973, since Roe versus Wade, there have been roughly 62 million abortions. But yet today, there are 60 million homeless young people that uh, don't have anywhere to go. And I mean, my goodness, life skills, education, employment, financial management, there's so much that could be done in terms of mentoring. So look, folks, I, I don't believe the government needs to be a charity agency. I don't think that was the founder's original intent. It is to individuals and churches and godly organizations that philanthropy is entrusted. And I know it's a big, complicated world, but I'm going to challenge you. Do you know what the Bible says in Psalm 127, verse 3? Psalm 127, 3, that, behold, children are a gift from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Some translations say a heritage. And as we talk about being pro-life, and we are completely so, let's remember that there's not only the pre-born life and the unborn, but there are those children that, that would probably give anything they could imagine to be loved. And folks, I want to say the second greatest gift God ever gave the human race, right behind salvation, is the gift of family. Think about investing yourself in the lives of those that need a family. What is truth? What is truth? Shabam, there it is, the big kahuna, the spicy enchilada, the fizzy lifting drink. The claim God exists is not a subjective claim. This is not an evidence problem. So, like, truth is basically subjective. Yeah, yeah. emotional. This is Debunk TV. Hi, Alex McFarland here. I want to thank you for watching this edition of the Truth For New Generation program. And let me say, it is so exciting 
to be sharing God's truth and seeing it change the lives of people, to talk to young people especially about how the Bible is true, compelling lines of evidence, undergird the Christian worldview, and even the history of our nation. And you have an opportunity to be a part of something really special, I believe. I want to tell you what we're up to. And here's a book we can send you. It shows about the, the schools where I speak, more than 200 universities. We're mentoring young leaders. We do a summer camp. I'm on the road incessantly. So if you'd like to know more about Truth for a New Generation Ministries, we're on the radio seven days a week. Uh, write to us or email. Let me send you this booklet. Also, I want to ask you to please consider supporting what we're doing. Uh, these are monthly donation envelopes, and I would love to send you some of these. Your monthly gift in any amount, it is tax deductible. It is being fruitfully used, and this is part of not only proclaiming Christ to the world, but saving America. This is a part of saving our nation. And so our nation, the only thing that can save this country and change the lives of all ages, especially young people, is truth. And together, we can link arms and proclaim that truth. Here's what I want to do to show our appreciation. For your gift of at least $50, I'm going to send you an award-winning DVD curriculum that I had the privilege of writing. We filmed it. It's got a leader's guide, study guides, the 21 toughest questions your kids will ask about God and Christianity. We interviewed more than 300 families with kids ages 4 to 13. And all of these questions like, if God made everything, who made God? How do I know the Bible is true? How do I know God hears my prayers? If I do something bad, will God still love me? Some of the questions these kids have, maybe these are questions mom and dad have as well. Uh, churches have used this. It's a great curriculum. For your gift of at least $50, I'm going to send you the 21 questions your kids will ask. And then if your gift is at least $75, I'm going to include this very cool, our retro t-shirt, Better Living Through Apologetics. It's got truth for a new generation on the back. And so it can show your support for the ministry plus spark conversations. Both of these, for your gift of at least 50, or if you include at least 75, we'll put in the t-shirt as well. Finally, I want to thank everybody that's reading our new book, The Assault on America, How to Defend Our Nation Before It's Too Late. I didn't make any money on this book, but it's available online. It's available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon. You need to read this book to understand how the country was formed, what's wrong, and how we can fix it. So keep us in prayer. Please promote, please support, and know that we are grateful. God bless you.